When we suffer, we want a lot of things. But more than anything, we want to go back. We want to go back to how things used to be, back to before he got sick, or back before when we were pregnant, or back before, back when we were young and in love, back when I was still ignorant. We want to go back. More than anything, we're homesick. You see, you were at home on a particular path and a particular way of life. And maybe it was the life that you wanted when you were little. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's the life, maybe you, you like everything about your life. Or maybe there were some things about it that you would change, but it was home for you. This was your life. And then something happened that disrupted it. There was this disruption. Someone gets sick, someone dies suddenly, someone has an accident, someone gets arrested, someone finds out what's really been going on, and all of a sudden the status quo gets pushed over, and you're no longer at home in your old way of life, and all you want is to get back to how things used to be. But then you slowly begin to realize that you can't go home again. There is no going back because you aren't who you used to be. Things are different now. You take the story of Job, for example. In the story of Job, we meet this character who is, who, who is happy and he's healthy and wealthy and everything is good and solid for him and he is sort of, he's at home in a particular way of life and then there's this disruption. He loses all of his children. His wealth is stolen and destroyed and he is knocked off balance and he wonders why am I not still at home? And at the end of the story, Job has more children and he has more wealth and he is sort of restored. And so on first pass, reading the story of Job, you might think that what it's all about is, is Job is at home and then he gets disrupted and then he gets to go back, except for one thing. Children aren't interchangeable parts, are they? Job doesn't get his children back. He has more children. Job never really returns to normal, does he? He lives out the rest of his days with an awareness that it could all happen again, that all it takes is one day, because one day changes everything. Suffering changes the game. I remember a few months ago, my in-laws were in town, and uh, my father-in-law heard this ticking in my engine, and I guess I'd been driving with it long enough that I didn't hear it anymore, and so I just tuned it out. I couldn't, even when he said, listen, I didn't hear anything, but he insisted there's this ticking in my, in my engine, and he says, the problem is you need to add oil. You're low on oil, and I said, oh, um, okay, well, I'll, I'll take care of it. He said, no, you need to do it right now, and I said, okay, I will take care of it. It is my car. I will handle it. It is okay, and he says, no, you need to add oil. And he just keeps, he just won't get on, off my back about this. He just says it over and over. And every time he says it, I get a little more riled up, right? <laughs> well, we're on this trip. And we're, we're with the whole extended family, we're going out to this lake together uh, somewhere up north close to Denver. And uh, he makes me get out of the caravan to go uh, find this little auto shop place that sells oil and we get some oil and we add it right there in the parking lot and he says, okay, now we can go. And so you can imagine at this point, I am just piping mad. I don't say a word the rest of the way out to the lake. And we get there, we're 45 minutes behind everyone else and I'm just, I'm embarrassed, not that we're late, but I'm embarrassed that I wasn't taking good care of my car. Well, we're walking around this lake and everything's real still and pristine and it's a nice pretty <coughs> fall day. And uh, I kind of break away from the rest of the group and I kind of take this time to reflect and think about why did I get so upset about this? Because it's not, it's not a big deal, so why did I make it such a big deal? And I realized, now you gotta understand, this is about a week after the eighth anniversary of my own father's death, okay? I realized that while I was upset, I felt for the first time in eight years, I felt like a son. I, I was like I was right back in high school, and I'm saying, Dad, get off my back. It's my life. I'll do things my way. 
I felt like a son, and it hit me all over again that my dad is never coming back. Suffering changes the game, and you can't ever go home. Even if you get sick and then you recover, you never really go back, do you? Because you aren't who you used to be. Now, before you suffered, you had a particular understanding of how your life was going to play out. You knew what tomorrow was going to look like. Before you got that tragic phone call, you had plans for later that day or for the next day, for the rest of the week. You had appointments on the calendar. You had dreams and ambitions and blueprints for your life. Tomorrow was, to a certain degree, predictable. Tomorrow was a place of hope and ambition and calculability. It was a place where everything gets better and stronger and faster, and tomorrow is going to be better than today. Tomorrow is a place of hope and love and expectation. And then we suffer. And the tomorrow that we were planning on is gone. And it ain't coming back. Suffering creates a new tomorrow. Because the world continues to turn and tomorrows continue to come, but they're not the ones that we were expecting. There's something else. And this new tomorrow is open-ended and we're forced to adapt. We have to learn to walk with a limp or we don't walk at all. The new tomorrow is different from the old tomorrow. The old tomorrow was characterized by hope and ambition and love and faithfulness and, and expectation. And the new tomorrow is characterized by uncertainty. The old tomorrow was always going to be better than today. Things are always looking up. But the new tomorrow knows better. That life is more complicated than that. Now, for thousands of years, humanity, all across cultures and eras, humanity has described these disruptions as a storm. And so the image is you're on a boat and you're headed somewhere and things are great and the sun is shining and then the winds begin to blow and water begins to wash over the deck of your boat. And if something doesn't change, you're going to sink and you are going to drown. This is the language that the psalmists would use when they would say things like, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. Or again, where it says, reach down your hand from on high. Deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters. Or uh, in another psalm where it says, um, your wrath, Psalm 88, your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. The prophet Jeremiah uses a similar image when he says, those who were my enemies without cause hunted me like a bird. They tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me. The waters have closed over my head and I thought I was about to be cut off. You see, water when it is out of control, when it's a raging sea, when it's a typhoon, when you're drowning, when water is out of control, it is a symbol of death and destruction and everything that stands in opposition to human life and well-being. But when water is under control, it's a symbol of life and hope. It's an oasis in a desert. It's a stream in a Thomas Kincaid painting. It's a well a cistern. And so when we suffer, we pray that God is going to take this raging storm and that he will bring it under control, that he will calm the storm. Like the psalmist who said, the waters saw you, O God, the waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Or Job, who confessed, God alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He wraps up its waters in clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. 
at the end of Job's story when God speaks to him, one of the things that God says is, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made, its, made clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it, when I set its bars and doors in place, when I said, this far you may come and no further, this is where your proud waves halt. For God, the raging sea is nothing more than an infant that needs to be swaddled. And so sometimes we suffer and then we pray and we say, God, save me. And then he swaddles the sea. A life is spared. A scan comes back clean. It turns out it was all just a misunderstanding. You make parole and everything changes. The storm passes. And in these moments, the only true response that we can offer is one of thanksgiving. And so the, the pattern is storm and then lament, deliverance, thanksgiving. One person said it this way, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. Another one said it like this, you answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness, O God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves and the turmoil of the nations. And still another said it like this, it was you who split open the sea by your power. You broke the heads of the monster in the waters. Storm, God save me. Deliverance, thanksgiving. There is a sense in which thanksgiving and lament live and die together. That you can't really have one without the other. Now, two weeks ago, I suggested that if the church is ever going to be truly honest and open and vulnerable with God, we have to reclaim the language of lament. We have to learn how to be honest with God. Lament is a form of prayer where we essentially hold God responsible for the universe. This is your universe. You're the one who made it. And so if things go right, he gets our praise. And when things go wrong, he gets the blame. And we come to him and we bring our beef to God. That is lament. Lament is not possible for someone who does not have faith. Because if you don't believe that there's a God, if you don't believe that God is good or that he has the power to change your situation, then there's no place for lament. But if you do believe that God is in charge and that he's good, then absolutely there is place for lament. And so thanksgiving is essentially a retelling of how God responded to my lament. I was drowning and then God rescued me and so now I give praise. I was in agony, I was in chains, my soul was burning to the ground and then I prayed to God and he delivered me. Thanks be to God. Thanksgiving and lament grow out of the same seedbed of faith that holds God responsible for everything in his world. Now, you can still give thanks without having lamented, but are we truly thankful for our food until we've been hungry? Are we truly thankful for our homes until we've been homeless? Are we truly thankful for our family until we've lost someone that we love? If God reigns over the entire universe, then he is to be held responsible when, when chaos overwhelms order, and he is to receive praise when he reestablishes order in the chaos, because it's all his world. There's a story from the early church uh, about a man who was crippled. Now, whether he was paralyzed or if he'd been injured or if he had some sort of disease, I, I don't know, but he was unable to walk. And so every day his friends would take him to a particular place so that he could beg from passers-by. Well, on one particular occasion, this man was sitting there begging and two disciples of Jesus who happened to be apostles were walking by. 
And because they're apostles, they have the, the ability to work miracles. And so they work a miracle in this man's life, and he stands up, and he picks up his mat, and he walks. And the text says that he went along praising God. Many of you know Jane Martin. She has a daughter-in-law named Lauren. Three years ago, Lauren had a blood clot in her leg that was threatening to break off. It was a very uh, delicate situation. She was in a lot of pain. And so they went to do surgery to remove this clot, and during the surgery, she had some nerve damage. And for the next year, she was either on constant pain medication or she was in withdrawal from the pain medication. And while they fixed kind of what they can, Lauren continues to live with chronic pain. Sometimes God calms the storm. But it has been my experience that most of us are more like Lauren than like the paralytic who picks up his mat and walks. Sometimes God calms the storm, but sometimes he doesn't. And when he doesn't, how are we supposed to live? Sometimes we learn how to give thanks because God has brought us through the storm, but sometimes we have to learn how to live in the rain. So what do we do when there's nothing we can do? How do we continue to put one foot in front of another? How do we form sort of a new tomorrow when the old one is gone? Well, one of the things we can do is we can learn to give thanks. Now again, thanksgiving and lament grow out of the same seedbed. I was drowning, God delivered me, so I give thanks. But I'm worried that we only know how to give thanks when God answers our lament in the way that we wanted him to. That we only know how to be grateful, we only know how to be thankful when things go our way, when God creates the world the way that we would. Glenn Pemberton is professor of Old Testament theology at Abilene Christian University. Uh, several years ago, he began to have pain in his right leg. He thought that perhaps he had fractured his tibia somehow. He went to the doctor. There was nothing wrong with his leg, but he was in this terrible, agonizing pain. And so the days passed, and the weeks passed, and the months passed, and this pain continues to grow, and it gets stronger and stronger. And eventually, his students started to call him Dr. House, like the TV character, because he's he would walk with a cane, and he's constantly popping pain medication, and he has a sorely disposition. Well, years later, he's been to all the best hospitals in the country. No one knows what's wrong with Dr. Pemberton. He continues to live with this pain, although now it's no longer just in his leg. It is so debilitating that he can't walk. He's confined to a wheelchair, and even just sitting in the wheelchair, he's constantly in pain. So as you might imagine, Dr. Pemberton has written a book on suffering and lament. It's called Hurting with God. At the end of this book, this is what Dr. Pemberton says. He says, it's easy to move from lament to thanksgiving when God changes my circumstances just as I want. My child recovers from leukemia. I didn't get a pink slip when the company reorganized. Unemployed, I land a job. Employed, I get the promotion. The doctor pronounces my spouse cancer-free. The hurricane veers north and misses my hometown. Paralyzed, my friends carry me to the Lord, and he heals me. When God works in our lives according to our dreams, we are grateful, and our faith community celebrate with us. I am concerned, however, that we only know how to recognize and celebrate God's work when it corresponds to our desires. Our definition of healing of any sort is narrow and deeply flawed, limiting gratitude to a thin slice of God's work in the world. What is there to be thankful for? What does Dr. Pemberton have to be thankful for? What does Lauren have to be thankful for? Or you think about the Apostle Paul who had this thorn in his flesh that three times he prayed that the Lord would remove it and he never did. What does Paul have to be thankful for? I mean, wouldn't that be a hollow kind of thanksgiving to give thanks when, when it seems like God hasn't done anything? Wouldn't that be a thanksgiving like, like thank you for this and this and this, but we're not gonna talk about this other thing where you didn't do anything? Isn't the thanksgiving of someone living in, a rain, in the rain essentially a thanksgiving that ignores the elephant in the room? 
Isn't it in some way a less authentic kind of thanksgiving? You know, I would argue exactly the opposite. That the person who gives thanks while living in the rain is in some way, that's somehow a more mysteriously and profound kind of thanksgiving than the person for whom God has calmed the storm. And here's why. Because the person for whom God has calmed the storm, when they give thanks, it's thank you, God, for doing what I wanted you to do. Thank you for answering in the way that I expected. Thank you that your way corresponded to my way. But the person who learns to give thanks in the rain is not giving thanks to God because of what he's done. He's giving thanks because of an undying certainty of God's love. It is, it is a thanksgiving that comes from a faith that does not gauge God's presence or love or faithfulness by my own situation, by my own health or wealth or prosperity. So how do we learn to live? How do we, what, what can we do when there's nothing we can do? We give thanks. Something else we can do, we can learn to trust God. But again, isn't it, isn't it true that the person who, who thanks God or, or who trusts God because they've already come through the storm, isn't that somehow a, a better kind of faith than the one who, who trusts God even in the storm because God hasn't really done anything for them? No, I would, I would argue just the opposite. The person who trusts God in the rain has a more authentic kind of faith than the one for whom God has calmed the storm. Because the person who trusts God because he's calling the storm trusts God because of his track record. God has proven himself, and so now I'll trust him. But the person who trusts God while living in the rain trusts him because of his word. Trusts him simply that he is who he says he is, even though my life doesn't seem to reflect that. It is a trust that is not born out of experience. It is a trust that is just trust. So what do we do when there's nothing we can do? We learn to give thanks. We learn to trust God. One more thing, we have to learn how to lament. We have to learn how to gripe and complain and be upset and beat our breast and raise our fist. And this is something that's kind of foreign to us, especially as Americans. As Americans, we are addicted to happiness. We measure whether or not something is true by whether or not it makes me happy. The person who is happy must be the one who knows the truth, and someone who's not happy, well, they, they must not know the real thing. They must have something wrong with their beliefs. We're addicted to happiness. And so we measure whether or not God has been faithful. We measure whether or not we can trust him by whether or not I feel happy. But when we live in the rain, we learn that there is a way to have faith and to be upset. Because we have a faith that holds God responsible for his creation. This is the way God has made the world. This is something that he has brought upon himself. And he can handle it. So we learn to give thanks. and We learn how to trust God and we learn how to lament when we live in the rain. Many years ago, Jesus of Nazareth was facing a storm of his own. He saw the end was coming and the tomorrow that everyone seemed to think was going to happen was slipping through their fingers. And in this moment, Jesus prays, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass. Jesus prays that things are going to change. God, I'm in this storm, deliver me. But as we know how the story turns out, God doesn't deliver him. Things don't turn out. The story doesn't go storm, lament, deliverance. It goes storm, lament, death. And even as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus dies feeling abandoned by God. Giving thanks is not something we do because God did exactly what we want him to do. It's something we do because Jesus has dwelled with us. God rides out the storm with us as our co-sailor. 
We learn how to lament because Jesus died in lament. And we learn how to trust God, not because of what he did or what, what, because of what he did in my own life or what he's going to do. We learn to trust God just to trust him. And perhaps this morning you have trusted God for many years, but you have only trusted a God who did things your way. You only trusted him when you came through the storm, when he swaddled the sea for you. That's when you would trust him. But other than that, you weren't so sure. Maybe your faith is older than your children are, but it's a faith that has only trusted a God who does things your way. And so whenever things don't go your way and there's something you don't understand, you stick your head in the sand and you, you try to ignore it. And you use faith as a substitute for suffering and you don't actually lean into that suffering. God this morning is inviting you into his presence to say whatever it is you really want to say. There is nothing you can say to God that will offend him if it's spoken in faith. But perhaps this morning you don't trust God. You never have trusted God. God this morning is inviting you to trust him even in the rain. Trust him just to trust him. And if this morning is the first time that you have done that, we want to invite you to be baptized. So you can find me or you can talk to one of our elders. Uh, we'd be happy to do that. We close this time in prayer. God, there are many of us who are living in the middle of a storm right now. Uh, we don't see anything getting better. We don't see a light on the horizon. We don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and we feel abandoned. Uh, and God, I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to talk to you about that and to tell you how we feel about it. Father, I pray that you, would, that you would fill us with faith, but that you would also keep us from using that faith to circumvent our own suffering. Father, we, we also have some who, uh, who are not going through a storm because we've already survived it. And Father, we give you the praise for this. We, we thank you that you, have, uh, that you have brought us through. We thank you that you reached down from on high and took hold of us and drew us out of the, the waters. But Father, for all of us, we trust you and we give you thanks that you have ridden out this storm with us, that you are no stranger to suffering. We thank you that you love us and Father, please forgive us when we measure your love or your faithfulness or your presence by our own situation. Lord, we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Love you guys.